The AAP and ACOG have affirmed their support for VBAC, but have urged caution when considering a TOLAC. VBAC is associated with a small but significant risk for uterine rupture. The risks and benefits of VBAC must be considered by the woman and her physician. For example, the risk for uterine rupture increases as the number of prior uterine incisions increases, and a woman who has had two cesarean deliveries might be reluctant to attempt VBAC for her third birth because of this added risk. She and her infant are more likely to have infections that further complicate their recovery and add to costs. The hospital also incurs greater costs for personnel and supplies. When making the decision about whether to attempt VBAC, women need to know that surgical birth has risks just as all surgeries have risks. Besides risks common to any surgery, multiple abnormalities such as placenta previa, low-lying placenta, or placenta accreta, abnormal adherence of the placenta to the uterine wall, often along the previous incision area. Therefore, the woman and her physician must consider the risks and benefits of both. Women may be anxious about attempting vaginal birth in a later pregnancy. The woman may know that she is a good candidate for VBAC, but find it impossible to disregard even small risks. Scheduling a repeat cesarean may seem safer and simpler. The prospect of laboring and perhaps still needing a cesarean birth is worrisome as well. The physician discusses VBAC during prenatal care if it is a reasonable option. The nurse reinforces these explanations and identifies misunderstandings. If the woman chooses VBAC, the nurse should reinforce the appropriateness of attempting VBAC and advantages of a vaginal birth, such as fewer overall complications individually. VBAC should be presented in a positive way if it is a real option, yet the possibility of cesarean delivery should be acknowledged because surgery can be needed unexpectedly in any birth. Cesarean section indications. Cesarean birth is performed when awaiting vaginal birth would compromise the mother, fetus, or both. Possible indications for cesarean birth include but are not limited to the following. Dystocia, cephalopelvic disproportion, hypertension if prompt delivery is necessary, maternal diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, or cervical cancer if labor is not advisable, active genital herpes, some previous uterine surgical problems such as classic cesarean incision or removal of fibroid tumors, persistent indeterminate or abnormal FHR patterns, prolapsed umbilical cord, fetal malpresentations such as breach or transverse lie, hemorrhagic conditions such as placental abruption or placenta previa, maternal request. Contraindications. Few absolute contraindications exist, but cesarean birth in some conditions is not desirable because the risks to the woman are too great compared with the potential benefits to the woman and fetus. These conditions include a fetus that is too immature to survive, a current fetal demise, or maternal coagulation defects that could cause harm to the mother in surgery. Risks Cesarean birth is one of the safest major surgical procedures. However, it poses greater risk for the mother compared with a vaginal birth. Maternal risks include the following. Infection, hemorrhage, urinary tract trauma or infection, thrombophlebitis, thromboembolism, paralytic ileus, atelectasis, endomyometriosis, anesthesia complications. Cesarean delivery poses added risks to the infant, which may include the following. Inadvertent preterm birth, transient tachypnea of the newborn caused by delayed absorption of lung fluid, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, injuries such as lacerations, bruising, fractures, or other trauma. Lung immaturity is the greatest risk if the fetus is delivered preterm. Therefore, tests for fetal lung maturity are done if elective cesarean birth is planned. Other criteria for assuring fetal lung maturity at the time of cesarean birth include the following. Documentation of fetal heart tones for 30 weeks by Doppler. Passage of 36 weeks since positive results from a pregnancy test performed by a laboratory. Ultrasound measurement at less than 20 weeks that supports a gestation of 39 weeks or more. Technique, preparation. Routine laboratory studies vary with the mother's condition and type of anesthesia, but may include a complete blood count, a blood typing and screening, 
The physician may order one or more units of blood to be typed and screened or cross-matched to have available for transfusion if the woman's hemoglobin and hematocrit values are low or she has a high risk for hemorrhage, such as grand multiparity, five or more births. Epidural or combined spinal epidural block is common for cesarean birth. General anesthesia may be required for either known or unexpected reasons. For emergency cesarean with no epidural in place, a general anesthetic may be chosen because it can be established the most quickly. A drug such as bimatidine, pepsid, or sodium citrate with citric acid, by citra, may be given to reduce gastric acidity before surgery. Preoperative care includes a timeout in which all members of the team validate the woman's identity, surgical site, and consent. Members identify themselves and their roles during this process. Fetal surveillance continues till just before the sterile abdominal skin preparation, intermittent auscultation, or external monitor, or just after the preparation, internal monitor. A wedge placed under one hip prevents aortic cable compression and promotes placental blood flow. A single IV dose of a prophylactic antibiotic, such as ampicillin or a cephalosporin, is given to the mother during surgery. There is insufficient evidence to support optimal timing of antibiotic administration. Many providers administer around the time the cord is clamped. Additional antibiotic doses for 24 hours are common to prevent postoperative infections in patients with an increased infection risk, i.e. prolonged rupture of membranes or a lengthy labor. If a fan and steel transverse or bikini skin incision is planned, the woman's lower abdominal hair is clipped from about three inches above the pubic hairline to the mons pubis, about where her legs come together. The fronts of the upper thighs are also clipped. For a vertical skin incision, the upper border of the abdominal hair clipping is near the umbilicus. Cordless electric clippers with disposable heads reduce skin nicks that provide an entry point for microorganisms. An indwelling catheter inserted after the regional block is established, but before the surgery, allows comfortable insertion and keeps the bladder away from the operative area to reduce the risk for injury. The catheter also may be placed before the block. The catheter allows accurate observation of urine output during and after surgery, which helps evaluate circulatory status. The catheter also allows delays of ambulation to the restroom for urination until the woman can safely ambulate. The grounding pad for the electrocautery is applied to an area with no bony prominences, usually the thigh. After application of the pad, the woman's legs are secured to the operating table with a wide padded strap. Risk for thromboembolism almost doubles for the patient undergoing cesarean delivery. Therefore, sequential compression devices are applied before surgery initiation. A sterile abdominal skin preparation is done just before sterile draping and allowed to dry before sterile drapes are applied. Surgical skin preparations vary in methods or application friction versus pain. Application begins at the center of the operative site outward from the pubic area downward on each upper thigh. It may be necessary to secure excess abdominal fat, the panis or apron, away from the skin incision area. Methods include using tape or a commercially prepared retraction device for this process. If a general anesthetic is required, Preoperative preparations are completed before anesthesia is begun to reduce newborn exposure to anesthesia. The team scrubs, dons gowns and gloves, and drapes the woman before general anesthesia is induced. Incisions. Two incisions are made, one in the abdominal wall, skin incision, and the other in the uterine wall. Either of two skin incisions are used. A midline vertical incision between the umbilicus and the symphysis, or a low transverse, Fanon style incision just above the symphysis. Three types of uterine incisions are possible, each with different indications and limitations. One, low transverse, two, low vertical, and three, classic, a vertical incision into the upper uterus. The low transverse uterine incision is preferred because of its low risk for rupture in subsequent pregnancies. The uterine incision does not always match the skin incision. For example, 
A woman may have a vertical skin incision and a low transverse uterine incision, particularly if she is obese or has a pre-existing vertical scar. A low transverse uterine incision may not be suitable if the fetus is very large. The length of this incision is limited because the uterine artery and vein enter the uterus at its lower right and left sides. The first incision may not be large enough to deliver a large fetus without tearing these large vessels. Sometimes a vertical uterine incision must be added to a transverse one, making an inverted T or J to deliver a very large baby. If an additional vertical incision is needed, bilaterally, a U incision is formed. A classic uterine incision occasionally must be used when the other two incisions are not possible, such as when a placenta previa is located in the lower anterior uterus. The vertical uterine incision, especially the classic one, is more likely to rupture during later pregnancies. Sequence of events in a cesarean birth. The sequence of events in a cesarean birth is similar to that of a vaginal birth. When the woman is anesthetized and draped, the physician makes a skin incision. If general anesthesia is required, the level is very light until the fetus is delivered and is deepened after the umbilical cord is clamped. The bladder is separated from the uterine wall and held downward with a wide bladder retractor. The uterus is incised, usually in a low transverse incision. If the membranes are intact, they are ruptured with a sharp instrument and amniotic fluid is suctioned from the operative field. As in vaginal births, the color, odor, and quantity of the amniotic fluid are noted and the time of rupture is recorded. The physician lifts the fetal presenting part through the uterine incision. An assistant may push on the uterine fundus to help deliver the fetus through the abdominal incision. A vacuum extractor or forceps may be needed to facilitate birth of the fetal head. The infant's face is wiped and the mouth and nose may be suctioned to remove secretions that would impair breathing. The cord is clamped and cut. Evidence suggests that a 60 second delay in cord clamping increases total body iron stores, expands blood volume, decreases anemia, and decreases rate of intraventricular hemorrhage in the preterm infant. The physician collects cord blood for analysis. After the infant's birth, the physician removes the placenta. IV oxytocin is given to contract the uterus. The physician then closes the uterine and abdominal incisions, getting each layer separately. Physicians may flush the operative area with saline before abdominal closure. Nursing care for the infant is similar to that after vaginal birth. Resuscitation equipment should be readied for use before delivery. Professional personnel who care for the infant born by cesarean vary with the baby's anticipated condition and facility policy. A pediatrician, neonatal nurse practitioner, or neonatal team usually attends the at-risk infant at the time of cesarean birth. Newborn care personnel must be prepared for unexpected resuscitation measures as in any birth. Nursing considerations. Nursing care for a woman who has a cesarean birth varies according to the situation. She may be planning a cesarean birth or a surgical birth may be unexpected. Even in these two situations, women differ. For example, is the planned cesarean her first or has she had a cesarean birth before? Was her previous cesarean planned? An unplanned cesarean birth may occur after hours of unsuccessful labor or may be needed quickly in an emergency. Nursing care for women having cesarean childbirth is similar to that for vaginal birth, but the approach in each situation is different. For example, although preoperative teaching is important, it must be abbreviated or even omitted in a true emergency. Emotional support. Emotional support may begin before and extend after the birth. A mother who has had a previous cesarean birth may harbor unresolved feelings of grief, guilt, or inadequacy because she perceived that she somehow failed in her expected birth experience. She may feel anxious about choosing repeat cesarean when given the choice of a VBAC, 
Therapeutic communication techniques help identify stressors and misunderstandings to promote a positive childbirth experience. Anxiety is an expected and normal reaction to surgery and is useful within limits. Staff's behavior can either reduce or increase the woman's anxiety. Calm and confident manner helps her feel she is being cared for by competent professionals. A quiet, low voice is calming. The nurse and the woman's significant others are important sources of emotional support. The nurse should remain with the woman and let her express her fears. Therapeutic communication helps clarify her concerns, so explanations to reduce her fear of the unknown can be most effective. The support person should be encouraged to remain with her during surgery if she has regional anesthesia. In some hospitals, the support person may come into the operating room after the woman is intubated for general anesthesia to foster attachment with the infant and help the mother integrate her birth experience afterward. Nurses also support a woman's partner and significant others during the cesarean birth. The partner may be as anxious as the woman, but afraid to express it because the woman needs so much support. The partner may be physically exhausted after hours of labor coaching. Staff should not expect more support from partners and can be reasonably provided. Although cesarean births are routine in the interpartum unit, they are not routine to women who undergo them and to their families. Avoid belittling their fears by telling women and their families not to worry and that everything will be all right, especially if an emergency occurs. After birth in the post-anesthesia care unit, PACU, the nurse begins to answer questions about the surgery and fill in any gaps in the mother and her family's understanding. Understand the experience and promotes a positive perception of the birth. Knowledge may reduce fear of the unknown and increase a woman's sense of control over her infant's birth. The nurse cannot assume that a woman who had a previous cesarean birth already knows what will happen and why. If her previous surgery was done after a long labor or an emergency room, a woman may recall only parts and not understand those parts she does remember. Teaching should be given in simple language and include her support person. The nurse explains preoperative procedures such as hair clipping in the incisional area, indwelling catheter, IV lines, and dressings, and their purposes. The catheter and IV lines usually remain in place no longer than 24 hours after birth. Sequential compression devices, SCDs, may be used throughout surgery and until ambulating well to reduce the risk for deep vein thrombosis. Women who have regional anesthesia, such as an epidural or a subarachnoid block, often fear they will feel pain during surgery. They do feel pressure and pulling, but the sensations do not mean that the anesthesia is wearing off. The nurse reassures the woman that her pain management is regularly assessed by the anesthesia provider. Having general anesthesia, the nurse explains why operative preparations are completed before she is anesthetized. The patient should be reassured that her surgery will not begin until she is asleep. She will not wake up during the procedure. The nurse describes the operating room and who will be present to make it less intimidating to her. Staff in the OR should introduce themselves if possible. The patient's labor nurse often is the circulating nurse during surgery and reassures her with a familiar face and voice. The OR is very cool in most cases and the surgery table is narrow. The support person should be told what to expect to come into the OR. If it is not already in place, an epidural block often is established after the woman goes to the OR. The partner may not be brought in until the regional block and other preparations, such as the indwelling catheter, are complete. These preparations may take 30 to 45 minutes if no rush exists. Support persons should be told they will not be forgotten and that apparent delays do not indicate problems. Surgery preparation time that moves quickly and efficiently for staff often moves very slowly for family and the main support person. And any equipment that will be used, for example, a pulse oximeter, electrocardiogram monitor, automatic blood pressure cuff, are explained to the woman. The nurse reviews routine assessments and interventions such as fundus and lochia checks, coughing, and deep breathing. The woman is taught simple exercises to promote normal circulation. The nurse reassures her that every effort will be made to promote her comfort with medication, positioning, and other interventions. Promoting safety. The woman's food intake is assessed for type and time on admission because general anesthesia occasionally is necessary. Oral intake and emesis during labor are recorded and reported to the anesthesia clinician.
Oral intake other than ordered medications and possibly ice chips is discontinued if a cesarean birth becomes likely. Tests to control gastric and respiratory secretions are administered as ordered. The woman is transferred and positioned carefully to prevent injury, especially if she has received regional anesthesia that reduces motor control and sensation. Bariatric operating tables are used for women with increased body mass index. Bony prominences are cushioned. A safety strap placed across her thigh secures her on the narrow operating table. A wedge under one hip or a tilted operating table avoids aortic cable compression and reduced placental blood flow. During positioning, the drain tube on the indwelling catheter should be routed under her leg to promote drainage and keep the tubing away from the operative area. The catheter bag is placed near the head of the table so that the anesthesia provider can monitor urine output, an important measure of fluid balance. The nurse verifies proper function of equipment such as suction devices, monitors, and electrocautery. Leads for the cardiac monitor, temperature, and pulse oximeter are placed to observe vital function. A grounding pad permits safe use of electrocautery. After the surgery, the incision area is cleansed with sterile water and a sterile dressing is applied. Blood and amniotic fluid are cleaned from the woman's abdomen, buttocks, and back before she is transferred to a bed. Lateral transfer devices are available to assist with transition off the operating table. Smooth transfers reduce pain and hypotension. Nursing care after birth. Intrapartum nursing care extends through the fourth stage of labor and includes care of the infant, the mother, and the family unit. Care of the infant. Nursing care of the newborn includes supporting cardiopulmonary and thermoregulatory function and identifying the infant. In addition, assess the infant for approximate gestational age and examine for obvious anomalies and birth injuries. A full neonatal assessment may be delayed for about one hour to allow time for uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact with the mother after delivery. Much of the initial assessment can be done while new parents are bonding with their infant. Maintain cardiopulmonary function. Assess the infant's APGAR score at one in five minutes and every five minutes thereafter until the APGAR score is greater than seven. This scoring system after birth allows for rapid evaluation of early cardiopulmonary adaptation. If the APGAR score is eight or higher, no intervention is needed. In supporting thermoregulation and promoting normal respiratory efforts by positioning and wiping secretions from the mouth and nose. If the infant is obviously in distress, no or low heart rate and respirations, limp muscle tone, lack of response to stimulation, blue or pale color, interventions to correct the problem are instituted immediately rather than waiting for the one minute APGAR score. A baby with a vigorous cry and minimal secretions is usually sufficiently warmed by skin-to-skin -skin contact with the parents, but a pre-warmed warmer should be available. Avoid an extended time with the infant in a head-dependent position because upward pressure from the intestines limit diaphragmatic movement. An infant in a warmer should be placed in a flat position or turned to one side with the head flat or slightly elevated. Wipe secretions from the infant's face and mouth. Suction the infant's mouth and nose with a bulb syringe if needed. Suctioning with a catheter may be necessary for more copious secretions. Support thermoregulation. Hypothermia raises the infant's metabolic rate and oxygen consumption, worsening any respiratory problems. Necessary to evaluate a transitioning infant separate from the mother, place the infant on a pre-warmed warmer quickly dry with warm towels to reduce evaporative heat loss. The head should be dried well because substantial heat loss can occur from the head, which is about one-fourth of the neonate's body surface area. The stimulus of drying the skin promotes vigorous crying and lung expansion in most healthy infants. Skin-to-skin -skin contact with the parent also maintains the infant's temperature and promotes bonding between the infant and parent. Delaying the first bath for several hours allows the temperature to stabilize. Avoid positioning yourself between the infant and the radiant heat source in the warmer. The infant should be wrapped in dry, warm blankets when not in the warmer or making skin-to-skin -skin contact. Remove wet linens, replacing them with warm and dry ones. A stockingette cap further reduces the heat loss if it is placed 
on the baby's dry head. Cap is not worn while the infant is in the radiant warmer because the cap slows transfer of heat to the baby. Identify the infant. Bands with matching and printed numbers and identifying information are the primary means to ensure that the right baby goes to the right mother after any separation. Check the imprinted band number and mother's name are identical on each set of bands and have the parents verify this information at the time of banding. Apply identification bands on the infant, preferably on the ankle to prevent facial scratching. Infant bands are applied more snugly than those worn by an adult with about one adult finger width of slack in the bands. Trim the excess band ends and apply the longer band to the mother's wrist. The mother's primary support person usually wears a fourth band. The infant will not be released to any adult who is not wearing a band with a matching name and number. A set of bands is needed for each baby in a multiple birth. Some facilities take an early photo of the infant when the infant is off an alert, which serves two purposes. Take for the parents and identification in the event of abduction. Other facilities use footprints for the same purposes. Care of the mother. Nursing care of the mother during the fourth stage of labor focuses on observing for hemorrhage and relieving discomfort. Observe for hemorrhage. Important assessments related to hemorrhage are the woman's vital signs, uterine fundal location and tone, bladder, lochia, and perineal and labial areas. Vital signs. Assess the woman's temperature when fourth stage care begins. Blood pressure, pulse, and respiration should be assessed every 15 minutes during the first hour or as indicated. A rising pulse rate is an early sign of excessive blood loss because the heart pumps faster to compensate for reduced blood volume. The blood pressure falls as the blood volume diminishes, but this is a late sign of hypovolemia. A rising pulse rate also may reflect medications administered. Fundus. The most common reason for excessive postpartum bleeding is that the uterus does not firmly contract and compress open vessels at the placental site. Assess the firmness, height, and positioning of the uterine fundus while supporting the lower uterine segment during uterine massage to prevent inversion or prolapse. Uterine assessment is typically performed with each vital sign assessment. The fundus should be firm in the midline and below the umbilicus, about the size of a large grapefruit. If the fundus is firm, no massage is needed, but if it is soft, boggy, it should be massaged until it is firm. Nipple stimulation from the infant's suckling releases oxytocin from the mother's posterior pituitary gland to maintain firm uterine contraction. IV or intramuscular oxytocin has the same effect. Bladder. A full bladder interferes with contractions of the uterus and may lead to hemorrhage. A full bladder is suspected if the fundus is above the umbilicus or displaced to one side, usually the right. The first two or three voidings are often measured until it is evident that the mother voids without difficulty and empties her bladder completely. Each voiding is usually at least 300 to 400 milliliters if she is emptying her bladder. If no contraindication, such as altered sensation, is present, the mother can walk to the bathroom with assistance the first few times. She should sit on the side of the bed to make sure she is not lightheaded, move her legs back and forth, and raise her knees to be sure she has adequate strength and movement before ambulation. Lochia. Assess for lochia with each vital sign of fundal assessment. The amount of lochia seems large to the inexperienced nurse and new mother. Perineal pads vary in their absorbency, but saturation of one standard pad, one that does not contain a cold pack, within the first hour is guideline for the maximal normal lochia flow. Turn the mother to check for lochia pooling under her buttocks and back. Small clots may be present, but the presence of large clots is not normal, and the provider should be notified. Perineal and labial areas. Observe perineal and labial areas for bruising and hematoma formation. Small hematomas usually are easily limited by ice packs that are also applied for comfort. Large and rapidly expanding hematomas may cause significant enlargement of the tissues involved, a bluish color, and pain. Observe the episiotomy using the acronym 
rita, redness, edema, ecchymosis, discharge, and approximation of edges of episiotomy for assessment guidelines. Promote comfort. Uterine contractions, after pains, and perineal trauma are common causes of pain after birth. Postpartum chill often adds to discomfort. Pain usually is mild and readily relieved by simple measures. Notify the birth attendant if pain is intense or does not respond to common relief measures. Ice packs. Apply an ice pack to the perineum promptly after vaginal birth to reduce edema and limit hematoma formation. Some perineal pads include chemical cold packs. These pads absorb less lochia than ordinary pads, so this should be considered when estimating pad saturation. Evidence shows that ice applied for the first 24 to 48 hours in 10 to 20 minute intervals rather than continuously is most beneficial. Analgesics. After pains and perineal pain respond well to mild oral analgesics. Regular urination reduces the severity of after pains because the uterus contracts most effectively when the bladder is empty. The nurse should encourage the woman to take analgesics as needed for both perineal and after pain discomfort. Warmth. A warm blanket shortens the chill common after birth. A portable radiant warmer provides warmth to both the mother and infant. The mother may enjoy warm drinks initially. Postoperative care. Postoperative care for the mother who has had a cesarean birth is like that for one who has had a vaginal birth with additional assessments and interventions related to the incision and anesthesia. Her temperature is assessed on admission to the PACU and according to protocol thereafter. If her condition is stable, other assessments are done every 15 minutes during the first hour and progress to every 30 minutes to one hour till she is transferred to her postpartum room. In addition to temperature, routine postoperative assessments include the following, vital signs, respiratory character, and oxygen saturation, return of motion and sensation if a regional block was given, level of consciousness, particularly if general anesthesia and sedating drugs were given, abdominal dressing, uterine firmness and position, midline or deviated to one side, lochia, color, quantity, presence, and size of any clots, urine output, quality, color, other characteristics, IV infusion, fluid rate condition of IV site, pain relief needs, function of the SCD. The nurse observes for return of motion and sensation if the woman had epidural or subarachnoid block anesthesia. The level of consciousness and respiratory rate, skin and mucous membrane color, rate and quality of respirations, pulse oximeter reading, are important observations if she had general anesthesia. Respiratory Observations are also important if the woman received epidural opioid narcotics, which can cause delayed respiratory depression. Naloxone, Narcan, should be available to reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression. Pulse rate, respirations, blood pressure, and oxygen saturation level provide important clues to the woman's circulatory and respiratory status. If oxygen saturation falls below 92%, it usually can be raised with several deep breaths. A persistent respiratory rate of less than 12 breaths per minute suggests respiratory depression. Deep breathing and coughing move secretions out of the lungs. Small pillow to support her incision reduces pain when she coughs. Position changes every two hours improve ventilation, reduce pooling of lung secretions, and decrease discomfort from constant pressure. As with vaginal birth, Fundus is assessed for height, firmness, and position. Examination is painful after regional anesthesia wears off, but the post cesarean mother also can have uterine atony. To relax her abdominal muscles and thus reduce pain from fundus checks, she should flex her knees and take slow deep breaths. The nurse can gently walk the fingers toward the fundus to determine uterine firmness. One who has a Fanon style skin incision usually has less pain with fundus checks than the woman with a vertical skin incision. Firm fundus does not need massage. The dressing is checked for drainage 
each funds check. The nurse assesses the lochia and urine output with other assessments. Lochia may pool under the mother's buttocks and lower back. Urine may be bloody temporarily if the cesarean delivery was done after long labor or an attempted forceps delivery. The urine drain tubing should be observed for gradual clearing of the blood. Urine should drain freely to prevent bladder distension, which worsens pain and increases the risk for postpartum hemorrhage. The nurse must remember that falling urine output is an early sign of hypovolemia. The woman's needs for pain relief should be regularly assessed. Received an epidural opioid may not need other analgesia during the early postpartum period. If she needs added pain relief while the epidural opioid is still in effect, the dose ordered often is lower than if she had not had that form of analgesia. Oral analgesics usually replace parenteral ones the day after surgery. A non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, such as ibuprofen, provides long-acting analgesia to supplement the epidural opioid. If she did not receive an epidural opioid, analgesia usually is given by patient-controlled analgesia pump. Promote early family attachment. The first hour after birth is ideal for parent-infant attachment because the healthy neonate is alert and responsive. Provide privacy while unobtrusively observing the parents and infant. The infant can remain in the parent's arm while the nurse takes vital signs, administers IM medications as ordered, and suctions small amount of secretions. Many newborn admission assessments can be performed while the parents hold the baby. Assist the mother to nurse during the recovery period if she plans to breastfeed. The infant is usually attentive and nurses briefly. Early nipple stimulation helps initiate milk production and contract the uterus. When the parents are ready, siblings, other family members, and friends should be allowed to visit. Help siblings see and touch their new brother or sister by putting a stool at the bedside or letting them sit on the bed. Toddlers are often upset by the separation from their mother and may not be interested in the new baby. With supervision, children of preschool age or older may sit in a chair and hold the baby. School-aged children are often fascinated by the new baby and surroundings and ask many questions. Adolescents react in various ways. They may be excited and eager to be a substitute parent, or they may be embarrassed about their parents' obvious sexuality at their age. Observe for signs of early parent-infant attachment. Parent behaviors are tentative at first, progressing from fingertip touch to palm touch to unfolding of the infant. Parents usually make eye contact with the infant and talk to the baby in higher pitched, affectionate tones. Cultural variations should be considered when assessing early attachment. The nurse should be knowledgeable about the typical practices of the populations commonly served. In some cultures, Great attention to the newborn is considered unlucky, evil eye.